So let me begin by saying welcome um, to our Intersections of Race, Class, and Health lecture series. This series has been running through the academic um, year. And my name is Tess Jones. I'm the Associate Director of the Center for Bioethics and Humanities and the Director of the Arts and Humanities and Healthcare Program. We um, are welcoming a very special presenter today. She is one of our Center for Bioethics and Humanities family members. And before my colleague, Dr. Daniel Goldberg introduces her, I would like to remind everyone about our final lecture in this series. It's, it is on Monday at noon, May 3rd, and we'll welcome Dr. Jonathan Metzel from Vanderbilt, and he'll be speaking with us. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Goldberg, who will introduce our speaker today. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones. I'm Daniel Goldberg. I'm core faculty in the Center for Bioethics and Humanities, and it's my great privilege uh, to introduce our speaker for today, who is Dean Dana Bowen Matthew. She is the Dean and Harold Green Professor of Law at the George Washington University of Law School. She has degrees from Harvard, the University of Virginia, and the University of Colorado Denver. Um, I've known personally of Dean Matthews' work long before I had the great good fortune to have met her when I arrived in Colorado five years ago. And it's uh, a privilege and an honor to count her as one of my colleagues and to learn from her. So I look forward to her talk um, and we're thrilled to have her back with us for a little bit. Daniel, I'm so grateful for this introduction. I cannot tell you how thrilling it is for me to be back home in Colorado. Uh, I want to say thank you so much, Tess Jones. When I saw your email come in, it just made me so happy uh, to be back in touch with you and Matt and Jackie and Daniel and oh, so many of my friends at the Center for Bioethics and Humanities. Your work has shaped me. It's been formative in my thinking. Um, and I just cannot tell you how much I look forward to the end of this pandemic when I can come back to the Rocky Mountains and see you in person again. Uh, the opportunity to talk to you today about the intersections of race, class, and health um, is uh, an honor and a privilege. So thank you for having me. I am going to ask you, Daniel, to do the favor you would do just for a friend. I have a uh, deck of slides that is probably too long. And if you would um, just even, I, I don't mind if you if you interrupt me at some point, uh, if it looks like I'm, I'm going on too long, uh, when I've got about uh, five minutes left. Uh, if you'll just let me know that that is uh, where I am in the time mark, I'll, I'll speed up a little bit. First, let me say thank you for using the word racism. Uh, that is not a word that is often used in ethics or in health settings. Um, and you do a great deal of my work for me. Um, and I appreciate it very much because you have not conflated the concepts of race and racism. Uh, I will spend some time talking about racism and defining it not only in terms of its individual impacts, but I'm going to specifically talk about structural racism and define it. Then I'm going to turn in part two to racism in healthcare and take my lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic. It is my view that this is just but one exemplar, the latest, uh, but for those of us that study race, racism and the intersection between racism and health, this is nothing new under the sun, even though this pandemic blows out of the water every other exemplar from a uh, size perspective uh, and so on. It is a repeat of information that we knew and expected and I hope can learn from this time around. And then lastly, I hope to give us some ideas about what we might do next. Um, so part one, racism defined. It is so appropriate to start talking about racism in a structural way, because as you know, Rochelle Walensky said, I know that we can create an America where all people have equal opportunity to live a healthy life. The fact that we in America do not have equal opportunity to live a healthy life is due directly because of racism, which is a public health crisis. And I applaud the CDC for recognizing such and so many parts of the country for following suit. We speak in health and healthcare about health equity. That is that everyone has a fair and just opportunity. What stands in the way of health equity that is the unjust, unfair and avoidable disparities that we are all experiencing broadly defined is inequality. 
inequality of every sort stands in the way of everyone having an equal opportunity to be healthy. I want to trace the theory of inequality and its association with poor health outcomes to structural racism, a particular brand of inequality. So I suggest that inequality is the greatest threat to health equity around the world. But structural inequality and structural racism in particular, that brand of structural inequality is unique to the American experience. Just a bit about inequality in a structural way. So on the left of this slide, you see the Gini index. That is the index that is defined by the World Bank to quantify the difference between the top and bottom quintiles of a society from an income perspective. So the top quintile and the bottom quintile are less unequal if those earnings are closer together. They are more unequal if those quintiles are farther apart. And as you can see on the left side of the slide, the United States is in a unique position of being of all the industrialized nations in the OECD, the most inequitable from a Gini index standpoint. On the right hand side of this slide, you see a, uh, a relationship uh, that uh, Pickard and Wilinski uh, have formed for us uh, in order to take that Gini in index along the X axis from low to high, left to right, and cross tabulate it with an index that they have described to, uh, uh, to indicate health and social outcomes. Right. So the quality of health and social outcomes is in a composite index on the y axis going from better outcomes to worse outcomes at the top by Pickard and Wilinski. And what they've done is taken 10 different categorical inequalities, inequalities in death due to heart disease, death due to cancers, death due to uh, uh, diabetes, as well as death due to homicide and some social inequities. They've designed a composite index and look at the relationship that they are showing us. That in the OECD nations and others, there is a direct and positive linear relationship between income inequality in a nation and its social and health outcomes. On the bottom left hand corner, you see that the lowest inequality nation is the nation of Japan and the best correlated index of health and social outcomes is the nation of Japan, followed by Norway, Sweden, Finland, Belgium, and so forth. Look at the far upper right hand corner. We in the United States have the unique distinction of being the most inequitable, as you saw on the left hand side. Uh, and the correlation here is that we are also experiencing the worst health and social outcomes. That is the relationship of structural inequality. The version I want to talk about in this talk is structural racism, that version of inequality, when inequality is due to the discrimination of people by their socially constructed race and ethnicity. So I'll start now with a definition by Kamara Jones in the uh, Association uh, Public Health uh, 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 Journal. She gave the definition of racism as having two features. One, it is a system that hierarchically orders people by race, right? System is the operative word, right? Because we're not just talking about individuals who are bigots. We're not talking about individual attitudes that are bigoted or discriminatory, but we're talking about a systemic organization of society that defines some as inferior and others as superior. You may have heard it termed white supremacy. I adopt that term, I'll use it throughout and show you why our healthcare system has embodied white supremacy, but a system of racism organizes people by their value, by their worth based on race. That's the first thing that Jones says that racism does. The second thing is that it advantages individuals by allocating power, opportunity, resources by that hierarchical system. So it's not only a definitional system, you're worth more, I'm worth less, your group is worth more, my group is worth less, but it also has the operational impact of giving people more or less opportunity, more or less resources, better or worse life chances based on that hierarchical system of valuing. So we can say structural racism is defined by a hierarchical pre preference where people 
have a value that is institutionalized not only by history, but by law. This is my uh, most important introduction, the importance of law in creating, maintaining, establishing, and sustaining structural racism institutionalized by history and law to assign an inferior or superior status, going back to Jones's definition, and to socially allocate resources and power, right? So the reason I have this broadside from the 14th Amendment before it was passed showing the constitutional amendment is because I now wanna to turn to the question of what role law has in creating, sustaining structural racism, right? That relationship, of inequality that is particularly racialized and which I showed earlier is like structural inequality in that it is inexorably linked to health and social outcomes, but a specific version of structural inequality because it is racial law is essential to that. I'll take a detour right now and teach just a little bit of constitutional law. It's not only the 14th Amendment that talks about equality by race, the 14th Amendment you're probably familiar with as the Equal Protection Clause in it. But before the 14th Amendment was the 13th Amendment, all of these are called Reconstruction Amendments. I know I'm speaking uh, uh, to some lawyers, and so this is a little bit of uh, a, re a review for you. Uh, but I want to focus on the 13th Amendment for a moment. Because the 13th Amendment, if I was in the room with you, I'd ask you to raise your hands and almost everybody in the room would raise their hand and say they understand the 13th Amendment to have been that Reconstruction Amendment that made slavery unconstitutional. That's the right answer today. That's what the 13th Amendment does today. However, the original 13th Amendment, the 13th Amendment that was drafted prior to the one that got adopted was called the Corwin Amendment. And it did the exact opposite. Let that settle in for a moment. The original 13th Amendment would not have made slavery unconstitutional. It would have constitutionalized slavery. What is the language on the screen? It would have said that no amendment may be made, that is to make an unamendable amendment that would give Congress, the federal government, the power to interfere with a state's operation of forced labor and ownership of people as property by slavery. That's what the original 13th Amendment said. Now, that would be just a historical nicety if it weren't for the fact that not only did that original 13th Amendment garner the requisite two thirds of the House of, Cong House of Representatives vote and the requisite two thirds of the Senate vote in order to proceed to the ratification process. That is to proceed to the point where each state had to vote on whether to ratify that as a part of the constitution by the time that we fired on Fort Sumter to initiate the Civil War, six states had already adopted this original 13th Amendment, the one that would have done the exact opposite of what today's 13th Amendment does. And again, this would be just a historical nicety if it weren't for the fact that in his second inaugural address, the great emancipator, Abraham Lincoln himself, spoke with, this, uh, uh, with approbation of this original 13th Amendment. Law is essential to maintaining structural racism. It is connected to the prior injustices that impact COVID today. It is connected to the injustices that allocate polluted air and polluted water in communities of color, that allocate by zoning laws, fewer hospitals and clinics in communities of color, that allocate by tax laws, fewer, fewer opportunities for healthy foods, healthy jobs, healthy housing, healthy transportation. Structural racism is structural because law continues to maintain it. It is the brand of structural inequality that is highly racialized. And I'm going to turn in a moment now to the COVID-19 exemplar, but before I leave the definition of structural racism and its connection to health, let me make one final observation. And that's this, structural racism kills everyone. Structural racism harms the health of everyone, not just the targeted minorities or marginalized populations. And the proof of this is legion. I'll use COVID-19 because I'm going to turn to that exemplar specifically. The proof of this in the COVID-19 context is looking at this 
map of the United States when the COVID-19 outbreak began in March of last year, where were the hotspots? Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Miami, large, densely populated cities, urban centers where black and brown populations were concentrated. And we were decrying the morbidity and mortality disproportionality with respect to those black, brown, and other uh, populations of disadvantage. But we ignored that to our peril because those weren't the only populations that were affected over time. This is a map of the hotspots in the United States as of two weeks ago, all over. It doesn't have any racial barriers. There's nothing specifically uh, poor, there's nothing non-porous about the borders between urban and rural centers, the borders between Midwest and, and far West states. Indeed, the racism that had us ignoring aggressive forms of intervention when this was a disease before over 550,000 people died nationwide is the racism that hurt us all. You've asked me to talk a little bit about racism as it is compared to socioeconomic status. Let me end this discussion and definition of structural racism by referring to a article by Phelan and Link, Bruce Phelan and Joe Link. Uh, they wrote in 2015 an article that is seminal. I recommend it highly. Is racism a fundamental cause of inequalities in health? The answer is yes. And it follows on their other seminal groundbreaking article published in 1995 that identified socioeconomic status as a fundamental cause of health disparities. Now, I don't have time to go into the brilliance of this model. I'm happy to do more with it in Q&A if there is time. But from an ethics standpoint, because this is my beloved Center for Health uh, for bioethics and humanities. From an ethics standpoint, I want you to please take two points or lessons from this slide and we'll apply them to the COVID-19 pandemic. One, racial inequality is not the same as socioeconomic inequality. It is a subset of and a different manifestation of socioeconomic statuses, uh, socioeconomic status disparities, right? There are health disparities that affect middle class, upper class, and underclass members of BIPOC communities, no matter what their socioeconomic status is, and that is because of systemic racism being a function of race qua race. Race as race is the cause of the disparities that are at the core of what we call disparities do the fundamental cause of racism. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two that I want you to please take from this article, this graph, this reference, is that if we fail in designing interventions to address racial disparities as racial disparities, to name them as racial disparities, to intentionally address those inequalities that are racial and ethnic in nature, directly, specifically identify those, we will simply exacerbate the racial inequality that we are experiencing today. That's borne out as a lesson that we can take, part two of my discussion from the COVID-19 pandemic. So this was taken from the CDC. As you know, this is a highly racialized disease. We are seeing that the hospitalization rate, if you are an indigenous American, American Indian is 3.7 times greater than if you are white. The death rate that is the rate at which you're popular, you are likely to die if you're a member of the American Indian, Alaska Native or non and non-Hispanic uh, Native indigenous populations is two and a half, almost two and a half times that of whites. We see the same multiples for hospitalization, nearly three times as often for blacks and nearly uh, 3.5 five uh, percent times, excuse me, more often for Latinx populations. These are morbidity and mortality numbers that we early on thought we could explain away by underlying comorbidities. Let me encourage you not to buy that myth that underlying comorbidities operate independent of structural racism, underlying comorbidities that predispose these populations to be more vulnerable to death and hospitalization and the severity of COVID-19 is because of structural racism. Place matters. That's the lesson to take from this 
photograph. If you've heard me talk before, almost every talk that I give includes this photograph. Let me tell you why. In January of 2009, US Airways flight 1549 took off from LaGuardia Airport intended to go to Charlotte, North Carolina. It struck a gaggle of geese in the ascent and was disabled. If you saw the movie Sully, you know that Captain Sullenberger is a hero. Captain Chelsea Sullenberger landed this plane on the Hudson River in January. The Hudson River is not conducive to life. The temperature in the Hudson River is below freezing. Look at the 155 souls that have exited the plane. This is a feel good story because all 155 souls on board were saved. But let's look at how they fared after they exited the plane. There are two distinct, distinct groups shown here. In the back of the plane, you'll see that most of the people, the largest group of people are congregated on the wing of the plane. And if you look at the tip of the wing of the plane, it is sinking into the Hudson. Those people lined up on the wing of the plane are likely to have better, uh, excuse me, worse life choices, decidedly worse life choices than the people in the front of the plane. What's different about them? The smaller group of people in the front of the plane are sitting in a lifeboat. They have life jackets on. They likely have little packages of food that mean if they are out there for a long time, they don't have to eat each other as early on as those who are on the wing if they want to survive. They have flares that they can use to wave down help, help, excuse me. The lesson from this and the reason that structural racism matters is because place matters so much to help. Place is what matters to those comorbidities that we reckoned were a predisposition or a pre, uh, condition precedent to death and hospitalization disproportionately affecting minority communities. It did not occur in isolation just because those people happen to have a greater incidence of diabetes or happen to have a greater incidence of obesity. They got it because of structural inequality. I'll name three examples. COVID-19 revealed structural inequality and structural racism in housing and neighborhoods, right? Early on, the residential inequality of living in a densely populated neighborhood with fewer healthy food uh, uh, resources, fewer green spaces for recreation, inferior access to health care. I live in Washington, D.C. now. I live in Northwest. I work in Northwest. Washington, D.C. is organized by quarters. The Southeast quarter, where the predominantly African-American population lives, has one major chain supermarket for 80,000 people in that part of the city. That is structural racism. And that is the structure that makes it likely that that population will be obese, makes it likely that population will be diabetic, makes it likely that that population is going to have the underlying comorbidity that made them more likely to be hospitalized with severe COVID disease or die from it. Similarly, that same population living in Southeast is also more likely to have been the victims of education, excuse me, employment inequality. So here again, New York is the exemplar and COVID revealed that in New York, 30% of the people who were continuing to be out in the workplace driving buses and other public transportation were black and Latinx. 20% of all food service workers were black and Latinx. I have to pause for a minute and go off script and say one of the things that were most egregious for me to find out, for example, just before the COVID-19 pandemic was declared by the World Health Organization to be a global health crisis, right? Latinx workers in the West who were undocumented were living in mortal fear of deportation, although they were guest workers here in the United States. They had some legal status, but not much protection. The day after the declaration, they were told they were essential workers, given a letter to say, you must show up. We who are sheltering in place, I'm one of them. I had the privilege of working from this office at this screen. I did not have to ride the subway such as shown in this picture in order to get to work. I did not have to interact with many people because I wasn't putting food on the grocery shelves. I wasn't a janitor, a cashier, a stalker. I wasn't one of the 25% of all public transportation riders in New York that were black and brown. Uh, but that population was suddenly essential to our ability to get DoorDash, to be sustained during the crisis 
at home. And yet that population lived in fear of deportation the day before the crisis was declared. I found that unethical, immoral, and highly troubling. A third social determinant of health that is revealed by the COVID-19 crisis. Again, New York is the exemplar, but it is only an example. We can find it all over the country. Colorado, I dare say, is another uh, place where we can find that. Educational attainment is disparate and discriminatory as a social determinant of health throughout the country. Right? We have educational systems that are as segregated now as they were before Brown versus Board of Education was decided in 1954. And what that means is what we see at the bottom of the slide, the achievement gap, we like to talk about the achievement gap, the outcomes differences between black, brown, and white students. They don't score as high on the SAT or the ACT or their math grade is not as high. This is not an achievement gap, I submit to you. It is a resource gap. Because in New York City, the inexperienced teachers are more likely to be allocated 11% of black and only 5% of white students attend where 20% or more of teachers are first year teachers, inexperienced teachers. In black and Latino uh, schools or predominantly black and Latino schools in New York City, and I dare say around the country, there is less likely access to AP courses, math preparatory courses, high level English courses in uh, 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 the International Baccalaureate Program, thereby making sure that those students are less likely to be prepared to go to college and get the kind of jobs that would keep them sheltering at home during a COVID crisis. And so the achievement gap is no surprise this is an example of structural racism and how it affects the morbidity and mortality disparities that we saw. But it's not only the incidence of disease, it is also the incidence of the cure. Remember what I said about Link and Phelan. Theorizing that structural racism is actually a fundamental cause of health disparities. This is a graph that I took from data at the CDC to show how each population by race is getting the cure, the intervention, the vaccine, right? And let me make it just a little bit clearer with these circles. All right, so along the x-axis, Hispanic Latino populations first, white populations second, Asian, Black, and uh, American Indian, multiple race to the right. Why have I circled three? Well, let's start with the peak. The peak where you see the highest gray line, which is fully vaccinated, is above the white population. They have the highest percentage of the population that is fully vaccinated. Staying with that population right there, the peak for the number of deaths, the orange line, the number of cases, the maroon line, and the number of hospitalizations, do you see that whites are the only group where their vaccination rate outpaces their number of cases, hospitalizations, and death? The exact opposite is true, far left, of Hispanic Latino populations, right? Their hospitalization rate is higher than their vaccination rate. Their death rate, their rate of cases of confirmed cases of COVID-19 disease is higher. Similarly for Blacks, similarly for Asians, we don't have quite enough information about indigenous populations in part because only 53% of states are collecting data stratified by race. This is white supremacy folks at its worst. This is white supremacy at its very worst. Those most vulnerable to the disease are the populations least likely to get the cure. They are least likely to have the intervention those least vulnerable who are white have better access. What do we do about it? If we're really serious, we take a page out of Vermont's book and we prioritize people by race. I find it immoral, unethical, that we as a society are okay, happy to allow racial classifications when they are to the detriment of marginalized populations, right? Examples abound. We were not worried about racial classifications in 1937 when we redlined districts, right? We are not worried about the voter suppression laws that disproportionately affect racial minorities in Georgia and elsewhere. But when it comes to racial prioritization that is going to advantage or reverse discrimination, we are altogether outraged. Vermont's race-based vaccine policy raises legal questions, we say. 
And I'm going to suggest to you that the law is a you know what, if that's the case. But for those of us who are timid about taking on what I think is an immoral race consciousness approach under the law, there are other ways the state of West Virginia, the state of California showed us how to use geographic or occupational prioritizations in order to aim for minority populations. We have social vulnerability indices and area deprivations indices that will help aim this vaccine intervention for populations. We can abandon the notion of a vaccine hesitancy being the explanation for why these populations, that is not so. There's data and I'm happy to cite it and discuss it at the Q&A, uh, but it's access to transportation. It's the way we've rolled out community health workers or the lack thereof. It's the way we've discriminated with respect to hubs and locations for the distribution of the vaccine. And it's the way that we're failing to stratify the disease. Listen, from an ethics standpoint, maximizing benefit is not enough. Interventions have to be race conscious in order to end racial discrimination. I'm gonna give you one more observation about structural racism lessons to be taken from the COVID-19 exemplar. This is a moving truck and it shows how I have moved. You heard uh, Daniel in this kind introduction say that um, I, uh, this was my moving company when I was getting ready to go to the University of Virginia in 2017. I didn't get to use that moving truck on April, excuse me, on August the 10th because this would have been my welcome committee. No exaggeration. This is what was happening on the day that I was to move to the University of Virginia. On the right, you see the people who were running around with tiki torches yelling, Jews will not replace us. What I don't think many people heard was that on the offbeat, they were yelling into the oven. Yes, they were saying Jews will not replace us into the oven. The guys on the left with the pointy heights, the hats, they're a little easier to tell. They look a little less like my students in constitutional law, a little more like somebody I can avoid and give a wide berth. But they're telling us that Jews are Satan's children and they spell Bible B-I-B L-E-I-L, these are the people that would have welcomed me. Here's the mistake and the message I want you to take from this slide and the next two. This is not structural racism. Don't get comfortable in thinking that if we are able to silence this group of extremists, that we've done anything at all about structural racism, we haven't. They are enabled by structural racism, that system that Kamara Jones tells us, hierarchically orders people, and gives resources. Make sure that these people don't go to school with that people, right? Same thing with respect to my move to this beautiful George Washington University where I have the privilege of leading right now. This is my welcome committee as of January 6th. I'm right on the corner where the Proud Boys and the Three Percenters were marching back and forth and getting ready to go and take the Capitol by storm to carry the Confederate flag and to wear t-shirts again that said six million Jews is not enough. That's what they wore. That was their garb walking into the Capitol with the Confederate flag. Don't make the mistake of thinking that this is systemic racism. Don't make the mistake of thinking that Derek Chauvin is systemic racism or the killers of Ahmed Arbery or even Amy Cooper who weaponized her whiteness in order to call police on a black man in Central Park. These are the manifestations of systemic racism. We have to go to the root. We are not relieved of responsibility because these, I'm sorry, wing nuts are running around the world wreaking havoc and hate crimes against Blacks, Asians, Asian American, Pacific Islanders, people of color, LGBTQ populations. They are a reflection of a system that we have tolerated, structural racism in healthcare is my next topic because 84,000 people die every year needlessly because of health disparities. We spend approximately $1.24 trillion in healthcare costs every three years unnecessarily. And why? Because structural racism affects every single one of the social determinants of health. Structural racism affects every single one, the social determinants of health. If we haven't learned anything from the COVID-19 pandemic, that's the lesson to take home. For the rest of this section, all I'm going to do is give you data from one location, my home in the South Bronx. I was born and raised in the South Bronx. Structural racism is alive and well in the South Bronx. I dare say it's alive and well in Boulder, in Aurora, in Denver, 
all over the United States, but I'm using the South Bronx to show that place matters, just like flight 1549's visual told us, place matters. This is the house I grew up in on the right side. That little front window on the right was my bedroom. And what I want to tell you about structural racism in the South Bronx, I can show you in about four or five slides. First of all, it's alive and well in housing. I don't need a sign that says we don't want you, Dana Matthew, in the South Bronx because you're black and we only want whites. That's the way racism used to operate. By 1937, it was much more subtle. The South Bronx was redlined, as this map shows. My parents could not get a mortgage at a favorable rate. And as a result, our income and wealth collection lagged behind whites in other parts of the city. And this was a highly racialized redlining system. I didn't need a sign that said, you're not welcome because you're black. All I needed was for lenders to say, when you get to that neighborhood, look at the, the uh, commentary. When you get to the clarifying remarks, when you get to that neighborhood, if you see an infiltration, a disease word, of Negro, Spanish, Puerto Rican, if you see that diseased population, don't lend to them. What's the result today? In 2019, the map of South Bronx, this is a New York City map, the map of the South Bronx on the left shows that between zero and $50,000 is the median household income in the South Bronx today. Zip code 10454 is right next to mine, 10472, uh, couldn't remember, it's been that long. The light green areas continue to be the least wealthy. The zip codes with the lowest median incomes are the ones that were structurally targeted for racism in 1937. I don't need a sign anymore. I don't need people walking behind me in order to tell me that I'm not welcome in their school because of the color of my skin as this photograph taken in 1957 when Little Rock, Arkansas was integrated. Structural racism continues in the South Bronx and elsewhere to make sure that the quality of public schools, look at the right on the purple, the light colored schools are the worst. Where are they? In the South Bronx. I don't need a person yelling at me anymore. The highest crime weight, these are corollaries. I'm happy to talk about the relationship between crime and quality of public schools. Where is it? In the South Bronx again. These structural decisions that we made by race bear fruit even today. It's the gift that keeps on giving. Structural racism continues to impact education and crime rate. Food insecurity in the South Bronx is greatest in the city where this dark blue circle, unfortunately my slide, um, uh, I changed the side and the circle is up in the middle of nowhere. That red circle should be on the dark blue area right at the south part of the Bronx, right? So I no longer need the photograph on the left where people are throwing food on me if I try to integrate the, uh, the, the uh, food counter in a store or in a restaurant, that isn't the racism that keeps me insecure by food, that makes sure that I have the most obese population. Again, forgive me for the circle. It should be smidgen down, a smidgen down so that it's at the dark blue part, again, in the South Bronx. Obesity, food insecurity, it's located in the South Bronx. I don't need overt racism to maintain the discriminatory environmental impact of dirty air and dirty water in the South Bronx. I don't need that anymore because zoning laws are permitting trash transfer services, highways. I have four interstate highways intersecting where I used to walk to school. So the fact that where I live in the South Bronx is called Asthma Alley should be no surprise to anyone. It is that the South Bronx is now called Sobro because it's in the midst of gentrification. So the South Bronx environmental discrimination continues, not because I have these overt racist lynching pictures in the South Bronx anymore as criminal justice inequitable in the South Bronx and elsewhere. Here the data is not only from the South Bronx, but from the entire United States. And I'm so sorry, this only goes to 2014. I have data through 2018. And what I'm showing you here is the arrest rate for more marijuana possession by race throughout the United States. Why is this of moment? Because the same racism, the same structural racism that you are seeing at this horrific celebration of the lynching of two black men is being played out in the United States with respect to the criminal justice system today, 
when you juxtapose on the right the arrest rate for marijuana possession by race with the actual annual use prevalence by race, you say that the black use rates shown by the light blue bars on the left and the white use rates shown by the dark blue bars on the left are pretty close together. Take it from me that by the time we get to 2018 and 19, they're almost equal across the United States. Ah, but look at the contrast on the right. The black rate of arrest for marijuana possession violations is far in excess of the white race arrests for possession of marijuana on the right throughout the United States. This is structural racism. This is what is causing health disparities, not only in COVID-19, but in every disease modality that we study health disparities in. And how can you help? I am imploring you to believe and to see that the health community, the health care community, the public health community is the key. I know that conscientious people at the University of Colorado and Schutz Medical Campus are doing individual debiasing. Don't misunderstand me. This is so important. Why? Because Implicit biases infect not only patient to provider relationships, but administrator to students, researcher to researcher, patient to patient. These are very important individual in in interventions. Moreover, structural interventions to make sure that we debias our organizations, to make sure that we are admitting students with policies that have results to diversify classes, not just by their international origin, very important not just by their first generation origin, very important, but please remember, Lincoln fail, is, fail and tell us that if we are not figuring out how to admit classes that have more African-Americans, indigenous Americans, and Latinx American populations, we are not serious about debiasing our organizations or seriously improving the healthcare system or its outcomes. If we are not changing the way that we promote and hire people of color, from underrepresented minorities, we are not serious about debiasing healthcare and improving the health outcomes. We are not serious about the quality of healthcare improving if we're not debiasing these, debiasing these qualities of delivery care. And in just medicine, thank you for referring to it. I talk about how implicit bias affects the delivery of healthcare. My new book, which is just health, comes out. In, it says the summer in my introduction, I'm sorry, it doesn't come out to the fall, but it talks about the fact that implicit race and ethnic biasing should be addressed, but it's not enough. I'm gonna close by saying we have to do more, we have to do better. If we learn nothing else from COVID-19, all the money, all the time in the world that we have spent on individual debiasing is not enough. We have to attack the structural racism. We have to attack the systemic racism and we in the healthcare industry are situated uniquely and perfectly to do so. I show this often. We did not see these scenes to desegregate hospitals. We did not see people with dogs marching in order to desegregate hospitals. I call desegregation of hospitals the quiet revolution. The fact that there are no longer white and black waiting rooms expressly in clinics and hospitals is because we had medical personnel Clinical providers, people in public health recognize that civil rights is a health outcomes issue. Because there was a partnership of medical and legal providers, we were able to form structural solutions that changed segregation in hospitals. The seminal case of Simpkins v. Cohen, I know most of this audience knows that this case was the watershed case that not only desegregated ultimately 7,160 hospitals in the United States, but it was brought by six physicians, three dentists and two patients who were arguing that segregated healthcare is poor quality healthcare. They saw what I am asking you to see as you think about what you can do. And that is that health outcomes are intimately related to civil rights outcomes. Another way of saying this is that we need a second quiet revolution. That if you care about health disparities, you have to care about voter suppression. It has to matter to you that the state of Georgia has passed over 250 voter suppression acts in order to de disenfranchise black and brown voters. That is the way that people in marginalized communities can affect 
the Civil Rights Act, the Civil Rights Acts of Healthcare, the ACA, that would address bias in healthcare, the Fair Housing Act that would address the social determinants of health, the Voting Rights Act, all of these civil rights acts are under attack. And one of the problems is that we are siloed in their defense. That instead of reckoning with the fact that all of the social determinants of health are affected by the Civil Rights Act of 1965, the Voting Rights Act of 65, the Colorado civil rights laws, Colorado police reform laws on use of deadly force, all of this affects health. I'm interested in seeing if I can't convince you to participate in a second quiet revolution where it's not just kids walking in the street and saying Black Lives Matter. I'm grateful for those. I'm ecstatic. As I said, I live in Washington, DC. When I go down to Black Lives Matter Plaza and I see that Black kids and white kids are both marching together, Latino and Asian kids are all marching together to say that Black Lives Matter, that Latinx lives matter, that gay lives matter. That's encouraging to me. What I'm asking is for this audience, for healthcare providers to join the fight for civil rights equality and declare racism a public health crisis. Right now in Colorado, two counties, Boulder County and Jefferson County have declared racism a public health crisis. The rest of the state has to do the same. I'll close with the stand of redwood trees, but I realize now I wish I'd used Aspen since I'm speaking in Colorado because the same is true of Aspen's as it is of redwood trees. And it's this, that although each of those individual trees look like individual organisms underneath the surface, their root network is intimately connected, intertwined and interdependent. The quiet revolution that I'm asking for healthcare providers, for clinicians, for public health workers, for those in academic health centers, to begin to involve themselves with, and there's lots of places to jump in, just jump in please, affects us all because we are all connected and we all need civil rights to be a second quiet revolution that we're fighting for, not just for the health of underrepresented minorities, but for the health of all of us in the United States of America. Thank you so much, Dean Matthew. So I'm going to help um, curate some of the questions that have come up in the remaining time, um, if that's okay. So we have a number of, we had some questions that were typed in in advance, and then we also have a number of questions in the Q&A, and I'm happy to field those for you, Dean, Bowen, or Dean Matthew. So, um, so let's see, this first one, the first one I thought that we might ask you to answer was from a student who's beginning their master's in public health in maternal and child health in June. And the question is, do you see significant opportunities to dismantle structural racism through public health interventions, even though policy and legislation change is the most pressing work? Yes. I do. Um, one of the things that I, uh, I love about the way that the University of Colorado is educating health providers at all levels, and Jackie Glover was um, leading this when I left, and I, I don't know if she still is, but interprofessional education, so that we use public health interventions in all aspects of clinical care, that we train people to use public health interventions in all aspects of, critical, of clinical care is key. Uh, one of the things that can happen when you look at a systemic level of racism is you think, oh, it's too big. There's no place to jump in. The fact is there is some place to jump in. And the person who's asked the question doing maternal and uh, uh, maternal and child health issues, boy, you're jumping in in one of the most effective places ever uh, for two reasons. One, uh, maternal health disparities are going the wrong direction in case you don't know. I'm sure that you individually know that. But the differences between death to moms in their first year after delivery uh, between black and white moms is getting worse. Um, the divide in outcomes is getting worse. So if you are interested in a public health area where you can look at systems of correction, where you can look at systems that delivery and make access to healthcare from a public health standpoint better, where you can improve public health systems and infrastructure. Maternal and infant health is a prime area 
uh, that will begin to solve the problem of systemic racism, even though I agree uh, policy is the paramount uh, need. Thank you, Dean. Um, ne the next question we have is from, um, that I think would be, would be helpful for you to try to answer is, as a nurse of color, what can I do to attack and influence the systemic racism beyond my unit and organization, especially when I feel that my voice is not often heard by my predominantly white leadership team? Yeah, um, so I, I, I don't know who this nurse is, but as I get to know you, I'll, I'll know whether I'm getting uh, too aggressive, right? Um, I think your work is uh, important both in and outside of your hospital setting. Uh, your voice is important with respect to how care is delivered within uh, the predominantly white and white managed um, institution where you work, uh, but it's also very important outside of that setting. Um, so within the setting, uh, I don't know where you are in the uh, organizational structure, um, but when you are highlighting disparities, uh, sunlight is best disinfected, you are helping people realize that there are problems to solve, right? So if you see um, that a patient population is receiving a different quality of care, if you see that the are consistently different types of uh, uh, treatment decisions, communication decisions, um, even uh, resource allocations with respect to uh, medical devices. If you see that, it's a matter of saying something uh, and bringing that to light. Um, if you are uh, willing to be a part of uh, study committees, of hiring committees, of admissions committees, uh, if you're willing to be a part of the structural solutions within your organization, uh, if you volunteer uh, to be a part of programs like this, um, if you're a research nurse um, and you begin to do the kind of research that connects the data in DC, excuse me, not in DC, in, uh, in, in Colorado, um, between social determinants and their discriminatory distribution and outcomes, then your research will make a difference. Um, if you're a researcher recruiting for clinical trials, then making sure that there are ways in which there are a representative population being tested, um, being uh, participating in clinical trials, all of this will make a difference. And then outside of the academy, if you're voting, for people who believe that racial equality is of paramount importance, then you are helping. If you are speaking out against voter suppression, if you are speaking out against housing discrimination, if you are speaking out against environmental racism and environmental discrimination, as a nurse, one of the things you might do is offer yourself as an expert witness or an expert, uh, uh, a subject matter expert for those environmental organizations that are addressing racial discrimination in the allocation of resources, uh, uh, the burden of pollution in the state of Colorado. So there are any number of places, and let me say that long list, you can't do all of it. One person can't do all of that stuff, but there are in every one of these lists, places where your heart skips a beat and you say, that's where my passion is. That's what I care about. And if every one of us would begin to realize that the place where our hearts get to be, that's your calling, that's where you have to address health disparities and racism, then we'll get something done. Thank you, Dean Matthew. It looks like we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, so one of the questions that has come in is since you were speaking about declarations of racism as a public health issue, this one looks timely. How do I encourage my county which is majority black and brown to declare racism a public health issue? I love this question because it means somebody said, wait, I can do that, right? I don't have to wait for the guy who is elected or who ran or, or who went to this school or that school. You can do that. Um, go to Google, find out who it is that's on your board of health and write a letter to every single one of them and say, you wanna know why they haven't declared racism a public health crisis since Rochelle Walensky did so two days ago, right? Make sure that if you get an answer that's the unsatisfactory, when it comes time to vote, vote the people who gave the unsatisfactory answer out and vote new people in. You individually can go to your board of health. You can go to the board of commissioners. You can go to the county supervisors and you could say, 
I want my county to be an anti-racist county. You are the voter that they are responsive to. Wonderful. Okay, um, here we have a question from our illustrious director, the Center for Bioethics and Humanities. So uh, uh, Dr. Winnie would like would like to know, so the, the prompt for the question, Dean, is that the IOM report on health disparities focused a generation of efforts to address bias on the individual level. So should the IOM revisit these issues to focus on systemic structural racism and health outcomes? That's kind of a, maybe a softball question, but I kind of want to- Yeah, oh, I like that. When I heard that Matt was gonna ask me a question, I went, well, I don't know, I don't know, Matt. I'm sure you know more than I do, but yes, let's agree that yes, they should. And if they want a consensus report and you're gonna lead it, please call. I will join your round table. I would love to be a part of it. But yeah, the time has come. That's kind of one of the things I hope are outcomes from my new book. Um, and, uh, and showing that systemic racism is, is, is really the target. We have to aim at the low hanging fruit, uh, uh, individual biases. Don't get me wrong. I think we have to keep working on those, but Matt, I think absolutely it's time for the Na National Academies of Medicine to look at systemic racism. Okay, I think maybe time for one more question. Um, is there a role for some type of reconciliation process, either locally or national? Yeah, I do. You know, it's really interesting. I could spend a, a lot more time on this. I'm going to say yes. Um, I'm going to say it's complicated in this way. Reconciliation means that there was once a relationship that was united and then it was broken. And we're trying to return to something, reconcile. I really don't think this country has ever taken equality of opportunity by race and ethnicity seriously. So we're not reconciling. What we're trying to do is restore reality to our articulated values. We said that all men are created equal. When we said it, women were unequal. When we said it, blacks were three-fifths of a person. When we said it, indigenous people were called savages. But we said that all men were created equal and endowed with certain inalienable rights by the creator. Let's make that true. And that's why I think that if we're really serious about health equity, and this is, I'll just close by saying this, if we're really serious about being a country where there is equal justice under the law, where everyone has an equal opportunity to be healthy, then civil rights, the law, will be all of our concern as a matter of public health. As a matter of public health, we ought to be concerned about civil rights and equality under the law. So Dana Matthew, I am hoping that we're gonna be able to capture and memorialize all of the questions and even more so the comments, the gratitude, the, the the, you know, the, the um, observations, the expressions of, of, you know, of thanks for your passion, um, of people being inspired by what you've brought us today. I'm hoping that we're going to be able to send all of those to you. Um, Dr. Daniel Goldberg, you were a master at moving those questions around. I'm going to now deputize you as as that going forward in all of these in all of these webinars. I want to thank um, you, Dana, for being with us today and for bringing us not just your passion, but for bringing us your truth. I like the fact that you say it the way you believe it, the way you feel it, and the way it is. And I think that our community has heard that today. And um, I think that they were gonna be moving forward and sharing that. So we deeply appreciate it. It was so wonderful to see you. And thanks to you know all of the team at the center who helped, who helped bring this together. Thank you again. Thank you for having me. We Bye. miss you. I miss you terribly. It was such an honor to be with you. Thank you very much. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Wow. <laughs>